presentation. Uh, some words, uh, a few uh, notes of myself. I'm a plant biologist by training. Um, I uh, own a professional beekeeping operation uh, and I since uh, almost more than a decade and uh, I provide uh, IT services in the field of information management and data management uh, for uh, almost a decade now. And I have been uh, in the past uh, 10 to 15 years almost uh, busy in the beekeeping industry at different levels. I'm, I'm a trainer for professional beekeepers. Uh, I, I'm a bee inspector, so I'm also exposed to all kinds of uh, problems related to bee pathology. Uh, and I've been working for several beekeeping organizations at different levels, at regional level, national level, uh, European level and uh, worldwide. Well, I'm personally, I'm based in Austria uh, and, um, um, well, uh, basically on the, on the left hand side, you see me with my uh, uh, occupation, which is uh, beekeeping. Uh, what's the content of today's session? Uh, we first of all uh, would like to uh, provide uh, information on uh, what kind of data should be provided uh, to the EU pollinator hub, uh, how to prepare data for integration into the EU pollinator hub, how to standardize the data. And uh, I would like uh, to show you some simple ways if you're already working on your data to enhance the value of your data. Uh, the EU pollinator hub is a data hub on which you can upload uh, data that is related to bees and to pollinators. Uh, it has a data model, which uh, it has actually been published. Uh, you might access that uh, by simply pointing your smartphone on the, on the QR code on the upper right hand uh, side of, of uh, this presentation. Uh, and since this presentation will be recorded, you might do that also after uh, this session. Uh, and here you can find a, a very detailed description of the data model. It basically can handle any kind of uh, data uh, that you might be willing to provide to this data app. So it's a, it's a very flexible model. It's based on relational databases uh, and uh, it can basically host everything uh, you might think of, of which comes in the form of, uh, of uh, data files. And uh, in the future, you can, uh, for the moment, uh, you will send this data to me and I will prepare it for uploading. Uh, in the future, uh, this can be done automatically by, by uh, a terminal um, which uh, you are, are uh, operating. First of all, a short definition of terms that we are going to use during this session. Data, what does data mean? Data, uh, singular is uh, datum. Uh, it may be defined in different ways, depending on who you are, what your basic occupation is. A statistician, for example, like Mr. Tsar, uh, would probably say that, uh, or actually wrote it in his book, uh, that uh, data is an observations, are observations consisting of numerical facts. Well, he's a statistician, so he's working with uh, numbers. Um, I would actually prefer uh, the uh, definition issued by OECD. Uh, and they say it's a quantitative or uh, data are quantitative or qualitative facts, figures and statistics collected for reference or analysis. So it's much more than only numerical facts. Um, data is, for example, uh, uh, you've got this variable here, which would be uh, weight of honey super, so data would be uh, 31.9 kilogram displayed uh, on, uh, on uh, the display of the, of the hive scale. Uh, and kilogram would, depending on the point of view, already be uh, metadata, which is a term that we will also address uh, in, after a few slides. Uh, there are different types of data. Um, and uh, depending on the type of data, you will have to provide different information. 
Well, there's the usual type of data, which we usually recognize as data. Uh, uh, that's uh, data on a ratio scale that comes with the constant interval size and a true zero point, which is uh, the normal kind of data that we encounter, uh, like uh, the weight of a honey super on a hive scale. Uh, another uh, frequent type of data is data on, on an interval scale. It comes with uh, a constant interval size, but it has no true zero point. Uh, for example, degrees Celsius or degree Fahrenheit. If we measured the temperature in Kelvin, uh, we would have a true zero point, but uh, usually use uh, uh, degree Celsius or degree Fahrenheit in, in practice. Uh, then uh, we've got the data on, on an ordinal scale, uh, which doesn't come with constant interval size, but uh, they are ranked measurements. And if you have ranked measurements, uh, it might already, like uh, this example here, uh, so, uh, that's practically me who's uh, doing evaluations uh, in the framework of uh, performance testing of the breeding program uh, for, for uh, honeybee queen breeding. And uh, we, we uh, attribute scores uh, to uh, defensive behavior and to calmness of uh, honeybees on the frame. Uh, since this is uh, our uh, ranked measurements, we might want to define what the single ranks actually mean. Uh, and uh, when you add an information or a meaning or a description in a human language, uh, problems, that's where problems start. Because if you use some spoke with uh, something that is defined with the human language, you have to uh, you, you may have different languages, so you, you have to define properly the term and you will have to translate that into different languages because this is, for example, one of the objectives of uh, the European Pollinator app, that it's accessible to everyone, especially beekeepers. Beekeepers often do not speak uh, a common language like, for example, English. So uh, to make uh, information accessible to everyone, you have to translate it and that uh, that's where things become very tricky. So that, that sometimes may happen with the data on an ordinal scale. It certainly will happen with data on a nominal scale, like uh, for example, and uh, you see all my exam my practical examples all come from some beekeeping, breeding. Um, uh, take as an example, uh, the color of the abdomen of, of, of a worker bee. Uh, which is uh, data that's been collected, collected uh, uh, in the course of performance testing. Uh, there you do not have values anymore, but you have attributes. And these attributes require description. And that's where it becomes really tricky, as I will point out later. And that's actually uh, require a collaborative approach uh, to solve this issue. The next term I would like to define before we start with practical examples uh, is the term raw data. Our raw data depends, uh, the meaning of raw data depends again on the perspective for you as a data provider, as a, a researcher, uh, as a field practitioner. Uh, uh, raw data is, uh, uh, and I again use the definition provided by OECD, uh, all original records and documentation or verified copies thereof, which are the result uh, of the original observation and activities in a study and allow a complete reconstruction and evaluation of the activity. So uh, it, it basically means that everything which these gentlemen on the right hand side of this image are doing, because they are actually doing a colony evaluation, uh, has to be um, somehow uh, uh, permanently recorded uh, somewhere, doesn't matter where, and uh, uh, the, it should be recorded in a way that uh, 10 years uh, after, and, and this happened exactly 10 years ago, 10 years after, you are able somehow uh, to reconstruct what you have done 10 years ago. Uh, in fact, 
a picture uh, like this could already be raw data because it, uh, it shows who participated in the evaluation of the colony. Uh, the metadata of the image could also tell you where the image has been taken and when. Raw data can be something like a sheet of paper uh, on which you uh, collect uh, your observations. If you do this with the pencil, you might want to make a copy of it and verify the copy and store the copy because you always want to ensure that your raw data is not deleted or changed. Can also be a, a, a reading from, from, from an instrument, for example, this raw scanner. Uh, which then produce, uh, uh, produces, well, this can only make images, but, uh, and this is why I included it. Uh, it uh, provides uh, a system where you can actually um, record uh, uh, the information, uh, the results of these uh, readings, of this uh, determination of the number of raw mites on a sticky paper. And so it provides you the number um of the raw mites but it also stores an image so you can uh, it makes the whole thing traceable so you can trace back and after 10 years you can uh first of all you can uh, the, the information is stored you cannot delete it and uh, if someone else has uh, has taken uh, these measurements you can actually uh, see uh, do quality control in this data and see if uh, the transmission of this data was correct uh, and uh, this is a very important part uh, of maintenance of raw data. Raw data could also be uh, an image like this one would be on a, on a honeybee on chestnut. Uh, here, uh, it's not the image that has the actual value, but it's, it's uh, the metadata of this image. It's the location and the time at which uh, this picture has been taken. Um, this is also stored and you cannot, uh, you could, manipulate it but you need uh, good IT knowledge to, to do that um, and it uh, it records uh, that you have the fact that you have seen a honeybee and a chestnut uh, on a particular position at a particular day and that would be a good example for all data. Another example for all data is a sheet uh, spreadsheet. Uh, it's a bad example because uh, spreadsheets can be manipulated and uh, it does not ensure that uh, the data that you have saved in a spreadsheet uh, is actually um, has actually been changed or not. Uh, but let's take a, a, a database application. Database application can be programmed in a way that it can be manipulated and uh, data can be stored across um, years uh, if of course uh, the software gets outdated for some reason um, you will not be able to access it so you have to be you have to be careful to maintain the integrity uh, of your data raw data from the perspective of the data hub uh, is something else it is any kind of data the data provider so you transmit to the data app. So at the moment it enters on the server or into my email account um, on, on my mail server. Uh, uh, this is the raw data. Uh, examples are data files, uh, some exchange format like uh, comma separated values, CSV or extensible markup language, uh, XML or JavaScript ob ob uh, object notation, JSON. Uh, this would be the usual uh, formats that we would prefer to receive, in which we would prefer to receive your data. Uh, it might also be other sources like images, videos, voice recordings, but uh, would discourage you from sending us uh, uh, data in these formats because our storage capacity is limited. And if you start to store a few images, you quickly run out of space. So usually it will be some kind of uh, file in, in one of these uh, three formats. Metadata, again, the definition for that. Metadata is data providing information used for uh, the identification, description, and uh, relationships of data. So uh, metadata gives basically gives data a meaning. It provides the context in which data has been assessed uh, and in which uh, data is 
expressed. Uh, it defines a structure of the data of the data. So it might be uh, like information database structure, for example, or on on uh, um, name of the columns, content of the columns, uh, uh, or uh, relationships between uh, different data, uh, different entities, different objects, and it enables uh, uh, retrievability across systems, usability, authenticity, and auditability across time. So it tells me uh, when data has been collected, with which method, it allows me to trace uh, back uh, how the, the data has been assessed, uh, when, uh, by whom. Um, it, it, it's basically information on the data that allows me to understand the data. One practical example for metadata is this receipt that I received uh, on, on Tuesday when I went uh, to the restaurant with a friend of mine. Uh, the data itself are single voices like this uh, glass of beer and, and uh, some, uh, some uh, the other uh, things that we consume for lunch and the metadata is everything labeled with red. For example, the name of the restaurant uh, and the address of the restaurant. It is this QR code that, uh, for example, tells the tax office, uh, uh, gives, uh, contains information which is relevant to the tax office. I, I don't know what exactly it contains actually. And uh, uh, information on the, on the valid add, added uh, tax components uh, in, 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 in this uh, invoice. Uh, so this is, uh, everything labeled with red would, for example, be metadata. Uh, metadata, which kind of metadata uh, do we require for the EU Pollinator Hub? Uh, that would be, for example, it depends a bit on, on the type of scale in which the data has been collected. Uh, it would be, for example, that applies for all uh, types of data be the owner or the owners of the data set. It will be any information regarding licensing, permissions, copyrights. Uh, uh, it also contains any uh, information on the relationships between the different objects. Uh, and uh, it should also contain, if possible, the method uh, with which the data has been assessed. Uh, information on materials used, on, on the procedure that was applied to collect the data, if possible. Uh, also, uh, position uh, on, on which the data has been assessed, uh, date, the time, the time uh, which uh, data has been assessed, the time in which the record has been created, uh, and so on. Um, for uh, uh, data on, on an interval and ratio scale, it would also be a good idea to maybe include, if available, a validation report, because that's also very, maybe very important uh, information on your data. Uh, you might also include the unit. There's a lot of data coming in that does not contain a unit. Well, sometimes it's obvious. For example, high scale data will most likely be measured in kilogram. Um, but uh, uh, it might also come from another, like the United States, and you would use a different, might use a different unit to measure uh, the weight. So you would also provide, in that such cases, you would also provide the unit in which the data has been measured. Uh, another uh, good uh, information would be uh, the expected range in which you the data uh, should uh, come uh, because that uh, can facilitate uh, the quality control. For data on a nominal scale, and partly also for data on an ordinal scale, it would also be desirable, I would say it would be really strictly necessary actually, to have a complete list of standardized attributes and descriptions. That's uh, like the example before that I made with the, the uh, uh, abdomens of, uh, of worker bees, uh, and uh, there you would provide all attributes and the description to these attributes. So you see it depends a bit on the scale in which the data comes, which uh, information, which metadata you have to provide. And this is basically uh, uh, the first 
part of my presentation, which uh, I'll, I'll try to uh, define uh, the terms that I will be used, uh, will use uh, in the rest of the publication, in the uh, rest of the, uh, of, of, the, of this presentation. Um, uh, data quality, uh, or the quality of the data that enters into my mail, uh, into my mail uh, box or onto the server, uh, at the end uh, depends on uh, the on, on the quality with which data has been collected. So, uh, good data collection practices are uh, the most important part of high quality data. So that's where problems start. That's where most problems actually start. Uh, if data has been, if uh, uh, practices were applied, uh, bad practices were applied during uh, data collection, um, usually also uh, the data itself comes uh, in, in poor quality, let's say. Uh, for uh, there are uh, good practice guidelines uh, which you can use. Uh, I just would like to mention here good laboratory practices uh, issued by OECD, or now there's also an EU directive. Uh, oh, now well, since uh, the, the eight years, there is an EU uh, uh, EU directive that actually contains these. Uh, OECD uh, principles of uh, good laboratory practice and compliance monitoring. Um, uh, this is mainly thought to be applied in, in the industry, chemical industry, pharmaceutical industry, but uh, that doesn't mean uh, that you cannot use it. Uh, it uh, provides a whole set of very useful, uh, very useful steps and actions that you should take seriously if you work in the field or in the laboratory, because it ensures not the quality of the data as I want to, that's uh, what I actually wanted to say with the image that I included on the right hand side. Uh, it doesn't ensure that the data is good, uh, just as uh, the action uh, this uh, man here uh, is carrying out, it does not mean that the, the result of his work will be good. But he's following um, standardized and uh, good practices uh, regarding safety, his own safety, not safety of the bees probably, but uh, his own safety. Uh, and uh, uh, he probably also uh, adds everything to a registry, so he's also recording everything. And this is a crucial step uh, in data collection that uh, can be uh, easily applied uh, following uh, the different uh, guidelines uh, used by or issued by OECD, and they do not also they do not only um, uh, focus on um, good on laboratory practices, but also to field studies, computerized systems, and data integrity. If you follow uh, the QR codes uh, provided on the left hand side, you will find these uh, lab these practices. Uh, I would uh, strongly advise you to read them and to apply them uh, in the next study you're carrying out. Uh, now uh, let's uh, go to data preparation and uh, cleaning. Uh, data preparation uh, can be carried out uh, or is usually carried out with specialized software, but uh, you might not be able to afford, uh, well, at least my example, I, I, I couldn't afford professional data cleaning software. It's very expensive. Uh, but there are quite good tools out there that can also be used and do a good job. For example, spreadsheets. Uh, the newest versions with uh, for, uh, Microsoft Excel, for example, if you have the 365 version, uh, it comes with a very good uh, data uh, uh, profiling tools uh, that uh, are very useful and work quite well, actually. Uh, I personally prefer database applications like PHP MyAdmin, for example. It's uh, it's easy to hand, handle, and if you know how to write uh, SQL code, uh, it, it it's good enough uh, for for uh, what you actually uh, might uh, require. Um, first step in data preparation is a visual check. 
got here a data set that contains about 19,000 records. So that's not a lot. Uh, this is something you could, for example, do with a spreadsheet. Simply look at your data and you will find uh, some uh, um, places which uh, might give problems like uh, uh, the um, like uh, this uh, expression os in uh, in uh, the column cadre, uh, where you have only numbers and in the middle you have a word that usually causes troubles later on. Uh, the same is true for uh, the column uh, FAS. Uh, it only contains A, B, A, B, A, B, except for one, for one uh, row in which uh, you have the word OS. That also might cause troubles later on with analysis. So you might want to check that. Maybe that was on purpose, but maybe it was a mistake. Another thing is uh, in in the in the in the left on the, on the right hand side uh, in uh, in in the column PCV you see again uh, uh, only numbers integers to be more precise and uh, somewhere in, this, uh, in one of the records you find uh, the uh, expression NA which means probably not applicable but it may cause troubles later on especially when you import this kind of data into database applications. So this is something you would probably, you might already reserve in, uh, resolve in, uh, uh, at, at the beginning. Uh, the next step after this visual control uh, is uh, a process that is called data profiling. Uh, it consists of uh, structural discovery of the data, of content discovery of the data, and of relationship discovery. We will limit to basically structural discovery and content discovery, because here you can already see, uh, you can already find a lot of potential issues that you can address. And uh, if you follow these few steps that I will show you, then you can make uh, data set uh, usually 99% clean. Uh, after this process, you will still, uh, some issues will still pop up, uh, but you have uh, an almost uh, clean data set. There is no, and, and this is something I can assure you, uh, and I've got quite a lot of experience with that, there is no such thing as a 100% correct data set uh, that simply does not exist. Um, data profiling, for data profiling, you might use different tools. You might use spreadsheet like uh, Microsoft Excel or, or uh, the LibreOffice version. Um, you might, if you are able to, to uh, write SQL code, you might use, for example, PHP MyAdmin. You might use R, which also contains element uh, that can be used in data profiling. You find here some links uh, to the software that uh, is basically like uh, PHP my admin which is embedded in the XAMPP environment or R is free software so everyone can use it. it's open source software uh, so it's usually quite reliable uh, the question for you uh, what to use for data profiling is uh, well first of all is, is it cheap is it expensive is it free it depends on your personal resources but also is it easy to handle uh, you will find a lot of uh, open source projects on the internet. Um, good luck if you want to try to install them because they are usually made for programmers, for uh, informatics speci specialists, which I'm not. So we had uh, quite a few issues installing these database applications. Still, uh, they do not work uh, as usually do not work as uh, according to your requirements. Another question uh, you have to ask yourself, am I able to write code, for example, SQL or, or uh, also for R, you need to, uh, to, to be fit on this side. So um, if you're not, you would probably go for another product. Um, another question depends a bit on your requirements uh, is, is, is the software validated? So uh, validated is it, it means that is it actually doing what I assume it is doing what, what for, for a software is not necessarily the case. Uh, uh, and this is the reason why many data profiling tools, good data profiling tools, certified data provide, pro, pro, profiling tools come at a very high price. It's expensive because 
they have been validated. So someone has uh, had a look if it actually is really doing what it is supposed to do. Another question that you have to ask, uh, is it comp compatible with my software, with my uh, hardware? Or is it GDPR compliant if you are within the European Union? So uh, do you use cloud services that actually are located in the United States? And if you're working with, um, with the personal data, uh, you would not be allowed to use uh, this kind of software. So this is something you have to ask and to consider if you buy or download uh, such kind of services or software. Sorry, sorry, Michael, to interrupt. Yes. We have a question in the chat uh, from Noah. How much expensive can this be? Oh, uh, to be honest, I, I have never made an inquiry. I've, I've been working uh, with SAS Maya, but that uh, costs uh, thousands of euros and uh, it goes to uh, license can be between hundreds and thousands uh, or dozens of thousands of euros per year. It depends a bit on 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 uh, on uh, on your requirements. If you need some uh, certified software, it uh, will be of course very expensive. Uh, but but yeah, you, you would have to make uh, 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 inquiries based on on your uh, personal or or uh, professional requirements. Uh, uh, a first step in uh, in data profiling. Uh, and uh, later on in data cleaning, um, could be to simply perform links between different uh, objects, between, for example, different tables. On, as an example, as a very simplified example, but it comes from a real uh, uh, from, from a real database um, or from a real table that uh, data set that I, I received. Uh, is a, a, a set of uh, uh, is a table with a set of, of uh, results of uh, of uh, results from colony evaluation um, that you see on the left hand side. Uh, you uh, just have a look on 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 uh, on, the, on the first uh, column, which contains uh, uh, information on the frame type doesn't contain the real frame type, it contains an attribute uh, that is later on explained in another table on the right hand side, blue. Uh, and this table contains all, uh, contains the information descriptions for all frame types that are uh, being used uh, in the original data table. Um, if you have a database application, you may join these two columns, uh, column frame type, uh, and perform a special type of join, uh, from a left join, uh, which means that uh, the integrity of the table on the left is maintained, and uh, the system simply uh, adds all corresponding, um, all corresponding rows uh, from the table on the right-hand side. That's why it's called the left join, actually. Uh, if uh, so, that's a basic join you do, and as a result, you get a new table that contains because we have added the attribute distinct, it contains a list of all distinct data instances for frame type in the left table and all uh, instances uh, of the joint of the table that's, that has been joined to uh, the original data table. And you, what you see is that two for two fields uh, get no join. We get no corresponding value in the table that was actually supposed to explain, to contain the description, to explain uh, the, the, the meaning of the attribute used in the original table. So that can have several reasons. Uh, one reason can be that, for example, you simply forgot to add uh, these uh, data instances in your table in which you provide the descriptions. Now, oh, this might be one reason. Another reason might be a typo because you, uh, the person entering the data uh, simply forgot to add uh, the one for P1 or 
Another reason might be if you have a short look on, on, on your keyboard, you will notice that uh, the letter C, at least if you use um, uh, my case, in my case it's a German keyboard, I don't know, uh, for other keyboards it might be different. My keyboard uh, C and V, the keys C and V are next to each other. So that simply might have been a typo. So by, by doing this linkage, you already find actually quite a lot of potential issues, 210 potential issues as a whole. You might do that uh, the same by using, or something similar by using uh, the function filter uh, in your spreadsheet. Uh, and you get for each column, you get uh, distinct instances, data instances, and you can just check if everything that you were expected to find in your table uh, already occurs, also occurs in this table. So this is more is is a, is is a, it's a different uh, step. It's it's quite uh, time consuming. It's not as easy as working with data with uh, with uh, database applications, but it's also possible. Um, so we have already discovered quite a lot of issues actually. Uh, another thing is, and uh, the example here is um, uh, refers to, again to the same data set, by the way, uh, in which uh, mm, the operators doing uh, the evaluations on the colony have been recorded, which is a very good thing to do, actually. Um, what I did here is that the, uh, the same thing, actually, that you could do uh, with uh, Excel. Uh, I ask, asked, uh, they told the database, database application to return all distinct uh, values in these particular columns. And if you look through that, uh, you will notice that uh, in two cases, you actually have the same um, operators. I, do not know the data, but I assume that every um, acronym stands for a name, for the name of the operator. And uh, in some uh, occasions, uh, uh, there have been two operators working uh, on, uh, on the same API. That's what I assume. And if you enlarge uh, these, uh, uh, these rows, you will see that uh, to uh, the blue and the red row, they all contain the same combination of operators, but expressed in a different way, uh, in a different sequence or using different, uh, uh, different signs. So that may be disturbing or not. Uh, it will definitely be a problem if you want, for example, to calculate the number of uh, records that have been made by a team of operators or by a single operator, because then you will get three different numbers for actually the same entity. So you most likely will do something that is called identity resolution, and you will uh, change not your raw data, but the, you will change uh, the clean the data set in so far as you go for substitute all these data instance instances with one single instance. In this way, you avoid potential analytical errors due to wrong grouping of data sets. And this is, as you see, it's very simple. You can do that with uh, basically with your spreadsheet. You could already do that. You just have to look very carefully. If you use a data application, it is of course easier because you can program uh, your uh, your SQL code accordingly. Another thing that you can do is something that is called structural discovery of your data. Uh, what you do here is not uh, is you do not look at the content, but you look at, at for example, the numbers of rows applying to uh, certain conditions. Uh, in this case, uh, we have. Uh, I have taken. I took uh, an example from uh, from uh, from the World uh, Agriculture Food and Agricultural Organization from the Statistical Division of FAO, FAO Stat, 
And uh, this is high quality data. So this, that, that there are professional uh, data scientists who do nothing else but caring of, uh, caring, taking care of providing high quality data. And as I said before, there is no single data set that comes without errors. Also high quality data like uh, from Faustat. And that has several reasons. One might be, uh, which rarely occurs a human error. Most times it will be due to the fact that, for example, countries did not provide the necessary data. In this case, it's uh, uh, item number 1182 is, uh, is actually the uh, honey production, and uh, it contains the number of records for EU 27, com uh, in 27 countries uh, that provide the number of records that have been provided uh, by EU 27 countries um, for each single year. Well, the first thing that you see is that uh, I uh, refer to 27 countries. And here we've got only 18 or 19 or 10 records. Um, this is already an indicator that there is something going wrong here, something missing. Another thing is that uh, the number of records per year is not constant, uh, but uh, well, uh, the number of member states uh, isn't neither, but in this case, it refers uh, to uh, all countries currently being member of the European Union. Uh, so also countries that were not members of the European Union in 1991 are also included in this evaluation, evaluation. So you would assume that at least from about uh, 19, 2000 on, uh, this, uh, with the exception of some, uh, for example, uh, um, with some small exceptions, uh, the number will be constant, but it's not. So obviously there is data lacking. So um, you won't get this data because FAO hasn't got this data. Uh, it's simply missing because it was not transmitted to FAO, but this is something you have to consider uh, when you do evaluations because you simply uh, have get wrong numbers, wrong figures, if you do not know that this issue occurs. Uh, and this is something you would probably uh, report in a data set quality report. Another thing you can do, and this is again a practical example, uh, again refers to the colony inspections that we've got. Uh, we had about 19, which uh, consisted of about 19,000 records. 19,000 records is for someone who has uh, 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 doesn't have a lot of experience and in, in maybe in, in, in data science um, uh, and uh, doesn't use uh, appropriate software is is actually quite a lot. If you work with spreadsheets, this is uh, um, it's easy to 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 uh, get these kind of errors. So it's it's not a matter of uh, bad. Uh, practice, but it's simply a, a completely normal uh, human error. Uh, what I did here is that for uh, these colonies inspection, inspections, they were made on a particular hour of the day, of course. Uh, they started at 9 o'clock and ended at, uh, at 19 o'clock. Uh, what I did is simply uh, uh, plot the number of records for each Hour. Uh, so what you can see here is um, that the people around nine o'clock started to work. Uh, then the number of records increases because uh, people have now started to work. It decreases again, again, uh, verse, uh, uh, around uh, 13 o'clock. That's probably when they had lunch. And then it starts again in the afternoon and uh, in the evening, the uh, colonies become, inspections become less frequent because people uh, stop working. But uh, you have, first of all, on the bottom, uh, about, yeah, exactly 732 records that contain a null value, so they contain nothing, which means that there is data missing. Uh, this is something that should be resolved. It, there may be a plausible reason for that, but this is something you should investigate before you send it to the BHUB. 
or I have to investigate it uh, if I'm the one who has to take care of the data set. And then you find uh, a lot of data, a lot of instances in which you actually have one record for each hour of the day, uh, starting uh, with 20 o'clock uh, and ending at eight o'clock in the morning. So this is something that's suspicious. Well, there can be a plausible reason for that, but you have to investigate. In fact, it was uh, an error uh, in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, during uh, data entry. And uh, this simple uh, evaluation helped us to find, to spot this error and to correct it. And this is a very simple operation which can be done with a database application, which could also be done with Excel. Uh, in, in fact, uh, this uh, uh, plot here is an Excel graph. A graphical uh, uh, representation of the structure of your data is always uh, a good thing to do. Uh, because it, it immediately shows the problem visually. That's why we include visualization of the structure and the content of the data in our data set reports. The problem starts when you have very large data sets. This is a, an example from FAO uh, that contains uh, more than 41 million records. So 41 million records doesn't even fit into an Excel file. So you couldn't even import it or you couldn't go through it visually. Um, I wouldn't do that anyway, because it, uh, it, it's simply impossible. In such cases, you can only work with database applications and uh, you would choose some sort of visual, uh, uh, visual um, uh, some sort of visualization of the structure of uh, the database. In our case, the number of records uh, for reported countries and uh, partner countries in the detailed trade matrix that is provided by Faustat. Well, in this case, I haven't really found great issues, except for the fact that on the right hand side, uh, there are um, countries with suspiciously low number of records, and you might want to investigate it. I just wanted to show it because it shows a very nice graph with a a lot of different colors, and, and that can help you uh, to understand the structure of your data. Well, now we have investigated the structure of our data, um, structural discovery. Now we move on to content discovery. Now we look uh, what's actually inside the data itself, the database itself, inside the content. One simple thing you can do to check if your data is plausible, is to simply do an average on uh, the relevant columns. Do, uh, you calculate the average, you calculate the minimum, and you calculate the maximum value. And if you plot, like we've done here uh, with the FAO data uh, on honey production uh, in uh, all available uh, uh, member states, we see that uh, on uh, the right hand side, uh, the numbers for Sweden, uh, we have a maxim maximum value that is suspiciously high. So in such cases, we would have a closer while the all other countries are more or less within a reasonable range. So the thing what we do now, or what we would do now is that we simply investigate the figures for Sweden. We'll most likely find out that there is a data that is not correct. Uh, this has been most likely a transmission error to FAO. And uh, in such case, we can't really do a lot because we could only call FAO and say, hi guys, we found a flaw in your data set. I don't know how uh, serious they would take these issues, especially for honey. In the case of honey, if you uh, deal with grain, probably more relevant. Uh, but honey is a minor product, and uh, I, I do not know how, how, how they would react, but uh, this is something you might do, might be a useful information for, for, for FAO as well. Note that I, I didn't use, a, uh, I used a logarithmic scale uh, to visualize this uh, potential data flow. So this is something you can do with every column you want, and uh, this is a, a very easy way to find out if there have been our problems 
in your data set. Again, there can be a plausible explanation for it, but it can give you a hint where to find a uh, potential data flaw. Uh, another thing, another practical example comes from a database that I've been working on a year ago. Uh, for about one month, it contained uh, about 19,000 records, again, um, on, uh, uh, and it contained basically the herd book of, uh, of a honeybee population. So it contained the, uh, the numbers, the ID numbers of, of the animals, of the queen, of the dam, of the sire, and it contained uh, the production values. And uh, unfortunately, this uh, data set has not been checked for, for years, for two decades. And, and uh, when I received the data set, I, I, it took me about one month to go to this, through this data set and to uh, actually resolve all potential issues in this data set. So it's, uh, that's what I told you before. Uh, if you uh, sample your data in a good way, in a good, if you apply good practices, uh, while sampling your data, it will save you a lot of time at, uh, on, on the other end uh, of the disk uh, when you have to check the quality of the data. Um, so uh, there are some interesting things so to give you a hint where the pro problems might be. Um, we have, for example, the production data. Uh, HO stands for honey. Uh, well, in such cases, uh, and this data has been got, has gone through a software, so it, it's it's uh, basically it has it has been elabor elaborated by a software. Uh, you have to know how the software works. Well, we know that the software never issues zero. Uh, whatever it does, it always issues at least uh, the number, the lowest possible number is one. Because if someone enters nothing in the production for honey, then the software replaces that with one. If you know that, you will be alerted when you find something like null or zero in your database. Well, this is what actually happened, and we corrected it. What, uh, there was something else we found because we found suspiciously, a suspiciously high number of records with zero uh in in higher numbers and so you had to check if these numbers corresponded to the to the actual to the actual to to to, to, to the raw data and we had to link the raw data uh to this database and we found out that uh, there has been in the past uh, a rounding error uh, they simply chopped off uh everything that was below uh um below uh, uh, one and the result was that we had a serious data problem in the database. And uh, it took me about one month to resolve these issues. Another thing is uh, to which you have to pay uh, attention is here. Um, it depends. Um, uh, one important thing, if you prepare data, uh, also if you work with uh, a spreadsheet like Excel, uh, is uh, to properly define the format of your data. If your data, for example, is an integer, or it is um, uh, a character, because once you import this data and you assume it is an integer, and uh, at the beginning it was um, actually a character, uh, you will uh, produce a problem, uh, which is the case for this number, for a queen ID with a leading zero. This number was originally a character. It received a leading zero, which is, is already very dangerous from, uh, from uh, a, 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 a from, from a, a data a point of view. And when we imported this data into, um, uh, uh, into, a, ta into a database uh, system, which was not configured accordingly, we actually lost this leading zero and uh, we could not, could not link this queen ID uh, anymore. We couldn't find it anymore. These are things you should avoid. So either you, for example, you avoid leading zeros or this is more important, you 
configure your database or your spreadsheet accordingly. So you set uh, the, the type format of your, uh, of your spreadsheet of, or, or of your database accordingly. This is a very important part or may become very crucial during data preparation and data cleaning. Uh, here we did um, uh, uh, a combination of structural and content discovery uh, on the, um, the content of a database that again contains uh, some 12 or 13,000 records on uh, a varroa infestation. And uh, what we wanted to find out whether uh, the number of records that enter in, into this database correspond to our expectations or if the uh, timing of sampling was uh, chosen correctly. And uh, we asked people to enter data from um, uh, the beginning of April and the beginning of July. And in fact, what you can see here, most of the data actually comes uh, from these periods. And this shows that uh, the data is structured more or less correctly, which can also be an important uh, message for uh, those who have to clean the data. Uh, now we are in the middle of content discovery. What you can also do with the same kind of data that I showed you before is a detailed trait matrix from FAO, uh, which as I said before, contains more than 41 million records. So it's just something you cannot uh, elaborate except uh, with, with Excel, you have to take a database application, or use a database application for that. Here, it's always useful if you want to see what the database actually contains uh, to make a visualization of the content of the database. And in this case, you see that there are different clusters along uh, the X and the Y axis and along the set axis as well, because there you see the export value uh, in uh, expressed in thousand US dollar and on the X axis, you see reporter country and the Y axis, you see partner country. So you can see where uh, and uh, to which, uh, which um, um, kind of data you actually find uh, in, your, in your database and that can be an important information later on uh, when you uh, elaborate your data. This is nothing, has got uh, nothing to do with, our, uh, with cleaning your data, but it only shows you uh, a method to express or a way to express the content, to show, to visualize the content uh, of your database in cases in which uh, the data set is really large. Um, the next chapter I would like to address is the is a tricky chapter. It's the chapter that uh, deals with standardization and definition of terms, and that relates to the thing that I uh, to the to the issue that I I, I mentioned uh, mentioned earlier at the beginning of this presentation uh, regarding uh, data on a nominal scale. Um, there is one exercise you could do when you exit from, from this presentation in the afternoon, you go uh, to the next, uh, to, 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 to a gen uh, geneticist and, and uh, ask him uh, to define the term gene or ask a taxonomist to define the term species or ask a, a beekeeper to define the, word, the term brood chamber. I wish you good luck. You, most likely you will end up like these uh, two gentlemen uh, on the right hand side uh, in the laboratory, uh, because it, it's, it's simply uh, very difficult uh, to define these terms. And we've got the same problem in beekeeping. Uh, take this an, as an example. Um, this is Bulgarian. I personally, I do not know, I do not speak Bulgarian. And I, I, I cannot read uh, Cyrillic uh, letters. So for me, this is data that I cannot understand. Um, nonetheless, we get such kind of data. Not, not in Bulgarian, this uh, unfortunately not, 
Um, but this is uh, an example, uh, a good example for, for, uh, for most uh, people in the European Union because the, the probability that you are not Bulgarian is, is about 90 or 80, 85, 98.5% uh, 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 or so. Um, so most of you probably do not understand what's written here. Uh, if you provide data on a nominal scale, please clean it up before. Please use a common language, which is English. Most of us speak English. If you don't speak it, please ask someone to translate the term. But translation itself uh, may not be enough. Another example here is French. Well, I um, fortunately understand French, but uh, many colleague beekeepers do not. Uh, so for them, uh, acacia et châtaignier means nothing. Um, for French, of course, uh, French knows that one is Robinia pure acacia and the other one is, uh, is chestnut. But someone who does not French, speak French, uh, he, this is, doesn't mean anything. So again, practical example, please use common language. Uh, this would best choice prob would probably be English. Uh, but there is another problem, and that relates to uh, the term acacia. Acacia uh, technically means anything belonging to the genus acacia, which actually wasn't supposed uh, uh, to, to be addressed because uh, what they actually meant was Robinia pseudoacacia, which is not belonging to the genus acacia. So uh, you should not only use uh, terms expressed in English, if possible, you should also use what we call the real world identity. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the term that actually refers to uh, to the to the entity uh, in the real world to the correct entity so here we come into run into big 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 issues because as i said before it's not it's already difficult to define to define a term like gene or species uh, it's even more difficult to translate these terms into different languages let me give you an example. Uh, let's take the different castes, uh, different uh, members of the uh, of uh, honeybee colonies. You got the honeybee queen, the honeybee worker, and the honeybee drone. Each of these individuals is something that we call a real world entity. So this is something that exists, or a table. If you if you uh, if you think that table does not exist, just bump your head in it and you will realize that it exists. So uh, this is something, uh, an object or a process or whatever that exists. And for each of these terms we have in a given language, call it, it's called language A, a term. So that's an easy situation, everything is clear, no problem. Well, uh, let's see what French people do. They have two different terms for drones. They might use one term or they might use the other term. And there, yeah, the first potential issue. Um, the second thing is, uh, and that relates to the problem that I tried to explain before, it relates to the name um, uh, for a particular real world entity used in different disciplines. Uh, in our case, um, a botanist uh, would call the, uh, the uh, tree uh, in, uh, um, uh, in, in image one, a black locust, Robinia pseudocacia. And the thing on the left-hand side, uh, number two, would call that uh, acacia. Uh, it's some acacia, I don't know even which species, species it is, but it's different. It's not the same thing. So a botanist would do the right thing. 
a beekeeper calls the thing uh, with number one acacia, which it is not. But the, for beekeepers, that's the term they use. Again, this is something you have to standardize and you have to resolve on the database level because you are going to share this data with people from different backgrounds and with people from, uh, speaking different languages. Uh, and this is a very difficult process. Or take another example. Uh, in German, uh, Prunus Armeniaca, uh, in, in German, it will be called Aprikose. In Austria, it will be called Marille. Uh, the Austrian would understand the German term, but Germans would not necessarily understand uh, the Austrian term. It's the same language, but it's a different dialect. And, uh, and you have for the same language, you have different terms in different regions. Or another uh, nice example is uh, uh, the term snow. You see my beehives uh, in wind, during winter, it's snowing. Well, someone coming from the Fiji Islands uh, has exactly one uh, term in his language for uh, the real world entity snow, which is, I don't know, I hope there are no people from Fiji present, uh, but it's like Uka Chivata. In Fiji, it never snows, so they have a term for it, but it's only one term. In Norway, you have, I don't know how many different terms for snow, because in fact, there are different versions of snow. Uh, so again, that's something that mice might cause troubles when you have data on a nominal scale. Um, or let's take this example uh, uh, from, from a database. Uh, here we have uh, data uh, that relates to hive body in French core and uh, honey supers in French boss. Why you would say, Bob, that's very clear. Nah, not really, because that depends very much on the country where you reside, because um, for an Austria, Austrian, uh, the term hive body might mean different things. To be honest, we do not even have a proper term for it because we have a different hive type. Uh, if you work with a dadant uh, or dadant hive type, the term brood chamber and honey super is very clear. That's logic. But if you work with the Langstrat type of hive, it's much, much less clear, especially if you work with two boxes in your root box. So this is something uh, that you actually have to properly define. And this is not something a person can do on its own, but you need a, a way, a procedure uh, to solve these issues. Uh, if you do something like the European Pollinator Hub, which is supposed to standardize terms and to do that across languages. So we have to define real world entities, which we are currently doing uh, in the framework of the Apimondia Working Group standardization of data on bees and beekeeping, which, by the way, this evening, at, I think at 18 o'clock or 19 o'clock is going to hold a session or which is done in international organizations like ISO or FAO. Uh, second step in this process is translation. You can use uh, dictionaries, you can use textbooks, you can websites to translate these real world entities into different languages. And then you have to validate these translations by experts. You have to uh, use a collaborative approach to actually do this because it takes a lot of time took me, for example, a half day to properly translate, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the, uh, the term, um, uh, as I mentioned before, the term hive body or uh, uh, honey super into five different languages. Um, another thing that you have to resolve and to clean uh, when you want to provide data to the pollinator hub or to any collaborative data hub uh, in this world is the problem with null, zero and blank. 
Uh, the problem comes, uh, problem, uh, uh, it's a problem because different types of, uh, of uh, data storage system, let's take a spreadsheet like Excel, uh, and uh, database applications like uh, those using sequence query language as a basis, is that for them, uh, nothing doesn't always mean the same thing. In a spreadsheet like Excel, for example, no entry means nothing. Uh, for a database application, um, there are two different instances of nothing. There's really nothing, which is nil, and there is blank, which is there is something, but it contains a blank character. There is a big difference. Uh, another difference is between zero and nil. So zero means the value zero, while nil means really nothing. Um, it doesn't make, uh, uh, maybe you, you do not really um, recognize the difference immediately, but uh, try to make an average on, on a column containing nil and zero values, you will notice the difference because if you include zero into the calculation of your average, it will give you completely different results. And if you do not include zero values in the calculation of your uh, average. And this has to be resolved uh, depending on the type uh, of uh, data you actually provide. So sometimes it would be desirable, for example, if you work with numbers uh, and there is really nothing inside to include the term nil instead of, for example, taking NA for using NA for not applicable because nil in the database means something. Um, generally use nil, the nil value to indicate that a value is missing, is unknown or is not applicable. Don't use terms like NA or unknown or missing uh, if you work with values. Um, standardization becomes, uh, is difficult if you have data on a nominal scales, it becomes a nightmare. If uh, it comes to, if uh, in case of annotations to records, well, it's perfectly, it's perfectly, uh, uh, it's perfect to add annotations to records and they can be very useful. And I often do that. You should actually always do that because you might always have the necessity to add annotations to record, but you should do that in a standardized way. Um, take uh, the example on the right hand side, uh, uh, that's a practical example, it wasn't written in Italian, it was written in another language, that doesn't really matter now. But for example, Nicola introdurrà una regina, that was an annotation. But first of all, it might be, become difficult to translate that, it's not really uh, a useful information for everyone, because if you provide data to a data hub, this data will be used by everyone. I personally do not know Nicola. And to be honest, I couldn't care less uh, that Nicola introduced a queen into a beehive. So this is not really useful information for me. It might be, but most likely it is not. So you would probably want to omit this kind of data, uh, of, this, of this kind of datum from your data set. Another example was uh, queen cell introduced by Michael Swarm in five frame hive. Well, this is much too complex as an information. Plus, it is very difficult to standardize this information and to translate it into different languages. Another example is a practical example, aggressiveness, uh, bracket five uh, um, uh, called, um, uh, colon 25 bracket. Uh, I, I understand aggressiveness. 
but I do not completely understand what uh, these uh, symbols and numbers after aggressiveness mean. So either you describe this in your metadata, which in this case wasn't the case, or you, and in such cases, you need to properly describe what you mean by five and 25, uh, or you omit it, or you uh, try to uh, include different information. Another practical example was uh, uh, what I found was like brutes naughty, chewed down, twisted in stomach ache position. Well, that's uh, why I, I added this image because it uh, well I had to laugh a bit because naughty brute is uh, well it's a funny expression, but um, it's it's very difficult to standardize. Um, uh, it's probably the wrong expression. There are more professional expressions for that. Uh, and uh, mm, it, it's very difficult to translate across languages. So if you have annotations, uh, keep only those annotations with that with, with the meaning for potential users and standardize these annotations. Avoid local slang. Use standardized phrases, terms, and expressions. Uh, use scientifically recognized terms in English language and uh, use pre a pre-configured set of phrases, terms, and expressions, which you include into your metadata and explain them in the metadata. But this is something you probably would resolve at the beginning during data collection. Uh, another problem that arises uh, when we uh, during uh, the cleaning of data, during uh, data profiling. Uh, it's not so obvious, but take this as an example, La Chapelle du Sérieux. Du Sérieux. Uh, this uh, sounds like a very good, uh, um, um, a normal, uh, uh, norm, the normal name of, of uh, uh, a municipality. The problem here is that it does not can, contain the hyphens between Chapelle, de et Surieux. Uh, the consequence is that you cannot find it in a standardized set of records that contain all municipalities in France. Uh, in this case, it would be a better solution to include, instead of writing the municipality into the record, uh, to use, uh, for example, uh, use a standardized code for municipalities, which in the EU would be the LAU, Local Area Unit Code. Because in this way, you can easily uh, find out to which uh, municipality the data provider was referring. Uh, you, there's also one instance I found in Austria, there are two villages with the same name. So if you only provide the name of the municipality, uh, you have two options and they are in completely different parts of the country. So you actually produce a problem. In this case, it would be a much better idea to use standardized terms, which, for example, is in the EU, the LAU code for each municipality. You might even want to add the so-called NUTS code, um, which I will explain later. Uh, these are standardized terms that uh, properly, eh, properly describe each entity. Another example, again, poor Bulgarians, uh, I, I mean also introduce the Bulgarian name, in that case it would be for me, for a user who does not speak Bulgarian, who cannot read Cyrillic uh, letters, would have some difficulties to find out what we are actually talking about. So in that case, in all cases, in all these cases, it would be better to use standardized codes. Um, the next thing is, and the last thing is I would mention is data enhancement. As you are already working on your um, on your data, uh, you might add additional information that might be useful for other users. Let's take an example here, the NUTS code, which wasn't present 
in the, in the original data set, which we have added. You might also add, like in this case, uh, weather stations from which you might retrieve um, uh, data that might be useful to interpret your raw data. Or another example, you have uh, a list table containing species, you might enter, you might add an additional code uh, from a database that contains a publicly accessible database that contains uh, the ID number, the identifier of a species, like, for example, the GBIF database. With this, you get, uh, you first of all, you properly define your species. You probably accessed this database anyway because you were just uh, checking if the, 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 the name of the species is the currently accepted species. So why not using the identifier that is already shown in on the website and in, in, insert it into your database, into your table? With this, you can access the page, corresponding page, uh, at GBIF, and you can get additional information for the user. Uh, in any case, uh, whatever you do, and that's what I mentioned before, uh, if you clean your data, and if you enhance the value of your data, or if you standardize your data during cleaning, please always refer to international standards and databases. And in the future, use the references that are provided by the EU Pollinator Hub, um, because we will uh, uh, provide a set of references uh, so to make it in order to, of existing rec references in order to make them more um, uh, easier accessible for you. Use, for example, uh, um, standards issued by FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Use, for example, um, standards that are issued by United Nations Department of Economic in, or Economics and Social Affairs, uh, the uh, statistical department of, of the United Nations. Uh, for example, uh, regarding countries or areas, geographic regions, because then you have a pretty standardized um, data set. If you are in the EU, use data sets or uh, standards issued by Eurostat. You can find it on the website of Eurostat and you will also be able to find that on later on on the website of uh, the EU Pollinator Hub. They provide a lot of different standards, for example, for local uh, administrative units, for nuts regions, uh, postcodes, uh, and uh, for uh, different uh, codes for, uh, for uh, uh, land cover, for example, Lucas and Cori. Uh, you might also use for uh, other uh, uh, applications, like of in other instances in which you refer to uh, species, uh, biological units, you might uh, uh, use, uh, for example, GBIF or ITIS. Uh, GBIF is the European uh, version of, of, of ITIS, uh, which contain uh, information on, uh, on taxonomy. Or uh, refer to standards issued by uh, ISO. The problem with ISO is that, in contrast to all other examples that are provided so far, is not for free. So you have to pay for it. It's pretty expensive, actually, to, to get it. Um, for terminology, you might refer to uh, IAT, uh, the European Union Terminology Database, uh, which is for free and which is very good. Uh, but you might also refer for translation to standardized tools like um, um, automated translation tools uh, that work with artificial intelligence like uh, Deepo or Google Translate. Deepo, in contrast to Google Translate, is, uh, is free for uh, common use, but there, is also, so there are also subscription programs uh, to which you might uh, enroll. Uh, Google Translate is for free, but of course, Google Translate uh, uh, is for free because it, 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 it comes with uh, uh, the use of uh, your data. 
And the last thing that I would like to mention is uh, traceability. It is very important that whatever you do during cleaning, that you always ensure that everything you did is traceable. Uh, the first rule, and, and this is um, the first rule, uh, is never ever change raw data. Raw data is raw data, and it has to remain such. Never touch it. If you change raw data, make a copy of it and apply the change to the copy. If you do that, document everything you do. Uh, like the guy on the right hand side, Hensel, uh, who is going to the to uh, who used stones to find back home. So whatever you do, document it. Every step you did, document it. Use standardized procedures. Write reports on the changes you made, and introduce flags or annotations to records if you applied a change because you might remember that for one day, you might remember it for a week, but you will forget it after a year. And then uh, it will be impossible to restore the original data or understand why you applied the change. Practical example is here. Um, whenever I change something, I record everything in a data report in a data set report or in a data quality report in which I record who did the change, when the change was applied, might be the date, it might also be necessary to record the time of change. I record what I changed and I give a plausible reason why I applied the change. And this is the only way to understand after a certain period of time why you did it and what you did for which reason and where. In a spreadsheet, this is a data set report. This is going to is produced is a, is a word document uh, in which I record everything. You might also do that uh, in your spreadsheet, as I did, for example, for for uh, uh, for the data. On, 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 on the, in, the, in the herd book. I added uh, corrections in the copy, not in the raw data, but in the copy. And I gave a reason uh, why I corrected it. I, I also record what I corrected. I record the initial value and I record the value uh, that uh, uh, with which uh, the original value has been replaced. I declare who did it and when it has been done. And in this way, you can always trace back if you made an error or find out why you applied the change. And this is an example, a practical example, uh, with uh, an X, uh, Excel file, in which uh, for every record, I added a reason uh, why I applied the change wherever you find uh, this red color. Uh, you can also do that in, in a database and there uh, you can design your database application accordingly uh, in order to ensure uh, the traceability of every change you made. Um, it might also be a good idea, and this is what we do within uh, the EU Pollinator Hub, to actually create standard operating procedures and uh, procedures which tell you what steps you have to take and what measures you have to take uh, to integrate data sets and to correct errors, to, uh, to uh, go through the whole data profiling process, what to do if you found an error, so the issue management. Uh, if you have standard operating procedures, it will be easier to work in a team because, for example, if one team member leaves the consortium, uh, it may be substituted by another one and there are already standardized procedures 
um, that this person may follow, so you don't have to set the whole process again. Uh, create uh, standard operating procedures for issue reporting, for issue resolution, for notifications of owner, and so on. For data profiling, for data visualization, and if you have standardized procedures, it will be much easier to operate in a team. Well, this was a set of, uh, of advices I, I wanted to give you. I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, now winter is approaching. Um, we're back on the desk, back from, from the bees. Uh, there's no work now to do. And uh, we will uh, heavily work on the EU database uh, and EU uh, pollinator hub. Uh, I hope to maybe uh, see you again as a data provider. Uh, if you have any question uh, regarding data uh, cleaning, regarding preparation of data, preparation of data sets, please contact us. You may contact me at this email address or you may contact uh, the manager, Noah Simon. And I hope to see you in the future. Thank you. If you have any questions, you may ask them now.